Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. The only podcast where it's okay to talk in band. On this podcast, you will be able to hear conversations with some of the greatest names in wind band conducting, composing, and arranging. We'll also visit with great college, high school, middle school, and elementary band directors to get their thoughts on various aspects of being a band director. We'll have regular check-ins with instrument specialists, music dealers, and instrument repair professionals. And if that's not enough, we'll even have regular conversations with Dr. Tim, who will help keep us motivated. That's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. And now, here's Charlie. Welcome to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends and this, podcast number 51 and number 12 in my second season. As always, I really appreciate you joining in the conversation and know you're going to enjoy today's visit with Chris Behrens, who is the director of bands at Beloit Memorial High School in Beloit, Wisconsin. I have known Chris for a very long time, and he has developed a really fine program in his high school and has had some truly amazing successes that you're going to hear about in just a couple of minutes. Well, it appears the vaccine is helping our world get back on track, and from what I understand, more and more students are back in school with face-to-face learning, and more and more music making is taking place, and that is nothing short of fantastic. It's been a long road for teachers, and I think an even longer road for students. So to get them back making music is another huge step. Unfortunately, during this time, a lot of things were lost. And some of them may have been students who were previously enrolled, or you were hoping would enroll in your program. But let me encourage you to not, that is correct, please do not accept their decision. At least not yet. It is so important for you to put a full court press on these students and their parents to get them back in and participating in your school's band program. Now, this may involve some phone calls from you, phone calls from other students, and even phone calls from parents. I have this belief that students recruit students and parents recruit parents, and all we do is, well, at best, facilitate the process. And you can facilitate the process by just letting those students know that you're thinking about them and that you care about them. And that is an important first step. Prior to the pandemic, a good friend of mine told me a story of their grandson who had decided to not enroll for band at the next level. He played tenor saxophone and was just tired of it. Didn't think he was contributing much to the whole picture. When the band director received the list of students who had pre-registered and didn't see his name, She made a brilliant move. She sent an email home to the parents that read something on the order of the following. We'll call the student John for the sake of this story. The email read, Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I tried to speak to John today after band class, but somehow I missed him. But I really wanted to speak with him, so I'm writing you to let you know why. When I picked up my list of students who have pre-registered for band next year, I noticed John's name was not on the list. Now, here comes the secret sauce, folks. You know, every year there are a couple of students who choose not to go on. And I don't really mind. But in John's case, well, John is different. I mean, I usually don't reach out to parents when a child decides not to sign up for band. But John, well, John has made so much progress this year and is really developing into a leader in the band. He is well-liked by his classmates And he is simply playing at a level so much higher than he did just a short time ago. It would be a real loss to our program and to all the time John has put into band thus far for him to give it up. And I hope you will speak with him about it, about this decision. And please let him know what great potential he has to really be a leader in our band program. Well, guess what happened? Yep, you are correct. John signed up for band, and you know what? Several years later, John is still playing the tenor saxophone in band. 
A few episodes ago on my podcast, I featured an interview with Don Stinson, the director of bands at Joliet Township High School in Illinois. And he told the story of Ray Kramer, director of bands emeritus at Indiana University and a past president of the Midwest Clinic. Dr. Kramer, when he was in school, decided to quit band and to quit playing the trombone. And guess what? The band director made a personal visit to his home and look what a gift to the band world that visit was. You see, folks, personal communication and extending a genuine caring for the individual means more than you can ever imagine, and it means more now than it ever did. We are coming off a time when students have been learning in front of a computer screen. It's like they've been in educational jail, not being able to be with their friends and playing in band. Now that they have that opportunity, they need to know they matter. They still matter, and they matter more now than they ever did. Many of these students feel a sense of guilt for not practicing or keeping up on their instrument like they know they should have. And now that band is back, well, they just might feel they're behind and don't want to embarrass themselves in front of their friends. But we know that is not the case, and we have to convey that message any way we can. We need to get their friends involved and have their friends get them to reconsider. We need to have parents contact other parents to encourage them not to let their child drop out. And that the investment they've made so far is more important than they could ever imagine. And it is important for directors to make personal contacts and to let students and parents know how you will help them get back to and get beyond the level they were playing prior to the pandemic. The ball is in your hands right now, directors, and the game clock is ticking. It's time to set your sights on the basket and give it your best shot. What do you have to lose? Nothing. What do you have to gain? A student who may have their life influenced in a positive way through music. All because you let them know you cared about them. We'll be right back with Chris Behrens after this. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning, and a proud sponsor of Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Listen to what we've been working on in this clip from our podcast. So I just finished uh, recording the uh, interface video with Braden, the what is it, why is it cool, and why do I need one? Well, part of that project was I wanted to try out a new piece of gear that I just got, and that's the Rode Wireless Go 2. And uh, so it's a wireless uh, transmitter and receiver system that can connect into your computer or your smartphone uh, pretty seamlessly. The really cool thing about this is that it can record each channel independently. One mic is going into the left channel, and the other one is going into the right channel channel. Uh, You can also control the input level from Audacity when you're connecting in to the computer through the USB-C. The uh, initial return on it is it did everything that I wanted it to. It allowed camera placement. To hear the rest of this podcast, please visit thepodcastingstore.com, your one-stop shop for everything podcasting and remote learning. This is Drew with thepodcastingstore.com. Now back to Charlie. Recently, I got a call from a former student of mine who teaches in Kansas, and he had uh, just been invited with his band to perform at the Essentially Ellington Festival coming up. I'm not sure when it was. And and when he said Essentially Ellington Festival, a bell went off in my head. And I said, well, I got to put you in contact with our guest, uh, who you're going to meet here in just a second, because this guy has had great success there. And, and I first met him, I think we're going to find out. Uh, when he took a class at Vandercook and I was just really impressed with him because he's a thoughtful guy and double sharp and always was such a positive contributor. And so I said, I got to get you on the podcast. And he consented to do it at a weak moment. And uh, so it's, it's a, it's great pleasure that I, I welcome to the, to the podcast, the director of bands at Beloit Memorial high school in Beloit, Wisconsin, Chris Barons. Chris, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you. Have for having me, Charlie. It's a, it's an honor to be on the show with you and um, spent many hours uh, walking and listening to the podcast and it's very informative and very entertaining. So well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Send me the bill for that, will you? And I'll, I'll just, I'll have to send you the bill. I'll send you a check here. Uh, Chris, I'm not sure the year I first met you. I got to help me remember. I think it was during a Mecca class or something uh, or you were working on your master's. Do you remember when it was? I believe it was sometime between 1996 and 1999. I know I have a Mecca class binder in my office that I just looked at uh, from a class I took with you in early August 
uh, called Organizing the Band, Strategies That Work. And I still have the binder, still look at it from time to time. And, and that, that had to be one of our first meetings, but I, I think it might have been a class or two before that. But I went on to do the summer um, Vandercook uh, graduate classes. And yeah, I just have a real um, appreciation for Vandercook and all the people that I've met there and all the great information I've received. Well, that's very kind. Now, add that to the bill, too, because we're going to, you know, it's <laughs> tallying up here. I'm going to have to take out a loan before this thing's <laughs> over. Uh, Chris, tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how music became a part of your life. So I'm originally from Watertown, Wisconsin, which is not too far here from Beloit. Um, I remember as a child having a white and orange Fisher Price record player. And according to my parents, I would play recordings on there and one of my favorites was a little drummer boy and i remember that being a very early experience with music and then in our living room we had a uh an old pump organ from like 1896 that's been passed down through the family i think you could buy those through sears roebuck at the time and uh that's still in the family i know we had it restored i remember playing some really early um songs uh on the organ and then Soon after that, we, we had a piano, and I was off with lessons, I think, around age seven. So you started piano first. Mm-hmm. So when did, yeah. when did band happen for you? Band would have been in fifth grade um, at uh, Schur's Elementary. I remember my uh, elementary band director very well, Mr. Al, Al Anderson, and we had um, – our lessons was in some kind of custodian closet uh, with about three other saxophones. <laughs> and, um, I just remember he had, he was right out of, right out of college, super energetic and serious and, um, just made a real good mark on, on me as far as band and, and all of my directors that I had through middle school and, and high school, uh, Jerry Borkert was uh, middle school. And then we had Tom Henninger and Ron Leroy up at the high school. And, um, I've had, I had a great, high school band experience. And in addition to that, I was still studying piano and, and, um, playing the saxophone. So, so what stuck for stuck most about those experiences during middle school and high school? Um, that's, you know, the, the band room was a, just a, a, a cool place to be and, and, and great things happened there. I mean, making music, but also all the, the friendships and, and, um, the social component, of course. And, and I remember going on some good trips and, you know, playing in the jazz band and, you know, the performances, all that obvious, stuff, but all those other things too, like the culture that's created in, you know, in the band room. So. Yeah, that's, that's really important. You know, as we've gone through this COVID and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's really one of the things that's missing. We've lost the culture exactly. and uh, lost that, that socialization and, and that that other part while we're while we're in band, yeah. So, but so what what, what point what point did um, uh, you decide I want to become a band director? So that's um, kind of an interesting story, I think. I mean, um, if someone would have suggested that to me, uh, say at the end of high school, I would I would have you know I would have dropped to the ground, rolled around hysterically laughing because I had no intentions of you know being a teacher. Um, and certainly not a high school band director. I was, I was really focused, I guess, at the end of high school on, um, on jazz and the piano. And, um, that's where my path took me into college, uh, was a, a jazz studies degree, my bachelor's at the university of Illinois. But, um, at some point along there, I also started teaching privately and I really enjoyed that. And when I was done with my bachelor's in jazz studies, um, you know, I, wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was looking at possibly a master's. And then I just happened to contact um, um, the jazz instructor back at, uh, who was running the jazz program at U of I, uh, Tom Berkner. And he happened to mention there was a graduate assistantship open. And I could, if, if I was interested, I could maybe pursue music education, um, my master's and get my certification. And at the same time, lead one of the jazz bands. And that's kind of how I backed into um, the whole band director thing. What made you choose Illinois, being from Watertown, Wisconsin? Ah, so the summer of my junior year, I attended a piano camp in Michigan, and I met um, a fabulous pianist, um, Tony Caramia, who was at, at the time teaching at University of Illinois. And so that that is why I looked into that program, because I wanted to work with him. 
Wow. So how were your college experiences when you started studying uh, jazz piano and, and jazz studies? How was that different from your high school? I mean, did you, did you look at that and go like, okay, this is a direct, this is a direct extension or was like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> no, I think, I mean, the college experience was more, you know, application of, of the skills that I'd you know, worked on or, or we're currently working on it. You know, Champagne had a really good scene for jazz and, and playing out and um, gigging and stuff. So there were lots of opportunities to perform with some other really great musicians. So that's um, what I remember most about that experience. So at least my undergrad was really, you know, um, getting serious about practicing and then being able to, to play and gig. So when you were an undergrad and you were practicing, how many hours a day were you playing? How many hours a day were you in a practice room working? I think when it was, you know, at, at the most, probably three to four hours a day. Wow. And that, you know, that, that was the time to do it. Cause as you know, as, as you get older, the, the time becomes less and less uh, to do something like that, you know? And now you require all your high school students to practice three or four hours a day, right? Well, right. I love them too, but you know, that's not reality. <laughs> so where was your first teaching position? Um, it was at Aldrich Middle School right here in Beloit. I was at, um, it was then a six through eight building. And I also had to do uh, beginners at six different elementary schools. Oh my gosh, so, six elementary schools. Yeah, it was uh, before school or at the end of the day. And then still doing the middle school program, a couple concert bands and a jazz pro, you know, jazz band. Um, but yeah, that's really, I, I, um, I think that experience giving my background, you know, um, coming into it from, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't looking at being a band director, but it was a great experience to teach beginners, teach middle school, you know, and then eventually end up here at the high school. Um, I think it was, it was perfect for me to go through that experience. I think I visited you when you were at the middle school, didn't I? You sure or did. Were you at, or were you at the high school? <laughs> no, you're definitely at the middle school. And I, I think you might've came up here once too, the high school. But yeah, I did. I, I did do the high school. I remember that. But I think the first yeah. time was I visited you at the middle school. Yeah. So, so when you were teaching at the middle school, now you've got this, you've got your degree in, in jazz studies and you've got your certification. Yep. And now you're starting to teach at this middle school. What did you reflect back on from your own personal experiences back when you were in junior high school and high school that helped help get you through that? Oh, um, well, you know, I, I mean, like I, like I mentioned earlier, the, the program at Watertown was an outstanding music program. And, you know, I, I thought a lot about just the way, um, I had interacted and, and, um, the way that those teachers worked with, you know, myself and other students at the time. And, um, and I know I even had some conversations with them, you know, called them up for advice at different times, but, um, no, I don't know of anything specifically, just, just the, you know, the feeling of, I was part of a, a, a really good music program and I, I felt important and, um, just those, just those, you know, those good feelings and, and making music and making it at a high level and, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff, I guess, is yeah. what stuck with me the most. So when did you move to Beloit Memorial? So Beloit Memorial <laughs> would have been 2001. So about, I think, five five or six years after I had been at the middle school. So you've been there 20 years? Yeah. And this is my 26th year of teaching. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. Yep. About 20 years. Wow. What made you move there? Um, well, there was, there was an opening and... Um, I know at some point I, I wanted to, to get to the high school, I guess, maybe um, for a lot of reasons, maybe other people do, which is just to work with, you know, more challenging literature and older students. Um, having done both now, I mean, I, I, I really love the middle school, too. I mean, there's certainly advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, but uh, just, I guess, the challenge and, um, you know, that, that kind of thing, I guess. So how is the program at Beloit Memorial different now than when you, when you took over 20 years ago? Okay. Yeah. So I, I should probably explain a little bit about how the program works here. Um, so when I first came, um, we had about 55 kids, um, one concert band, we had, we had a marching band, um, that we no longer have now. And I'll, I'll explain, I guess, how that happened. But, 
um, we did uh, competitive marching for my first couple of years. We, I, uh, we have a fan, uh, a partnership with Phantom Regiment, which we still have to this day where they come and use our building several times a year and make a donation to the band program. And, but when, when I first came here, we were, you know, we used their, uh, equipment, their truck, and we got some staffing from them. We did the competitive marching band for a couple of years. And, um, right after the second year, we had some, um, budget issues where they cut the middle school position for band. So wow. then it was like, okay, now you're going to go back, back to Aldrich, um, and teach the middle school and high school program, at least for a couple of years. So that's kind of how the marching band program, um, um, ceased to exist after that. Just, it was impossible to do. And then eventually I'd get, um, we'd get that position back. Um, but we just, the marching band thing never happened again here. Um, and, uh, I know a lot of people that are very passionate about that and, uh, I guess my, you know, my passion is more in the concert and jazz arena than, than marching band. And, um, you know, that's just, uh, and okay. Not, <laughs> nothing against our football team, but, um, we haven't, uh, you know, they, they, we haven't won a whole lot of games. And so it's just not, it's not like, uh, um, it's, you know, it's just not something people come to, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So, so, but you have a football team and I, we do. I you probably we have do. a, you have a band that plays at the games. Yeah. We still, oh yeah. We still do pep band. Uh, we still do basketball games. We, st I mean, so that's still our con contribution as far as, mm -hmm. you know, I see that as a, you know, community, community support and our kind of our um, way of our service, you know, to the school is still through those kinds of things. And I, I still find that important and people still love coming to hear the band in that regard. So yeah, and I think for the for the listeners, you know, Beloit is a pretty blue collar area, if if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. It so is. I I trust that a lot of your kids are also working while they're going to high school. Yeah, we do have we do have a lot of kids that work. Yep. Um, so yeah, there's there's um, you know, when you're trying, I guess if if you're you know looking at some kind of marching program in regards to that, that's it's hard to make that work. And we, you know, the two years that we did it we made it work, but it just wasn't something sustainable. It's expensive as everybody knows. And, um, it just wasn't the right fit for us here in this community. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we connected because a director who, who received his master's from uh, Vandercook and is a good friend of mine, uh, received an invitation for his high school jazz band to participate in the essential, essentially Ellington competition with Wynton Marcellus. And as I said, I immediately thought of you and, and, connected the two of you. And I, by the way, thank you very much for uh, uh, taking time to speak with him. He really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bob's a great guy. And uh, we had a great conversation, talked a lot about the festival, obviously. Um, it's a little bit different this year because it's going to be virtual. Um, so we would have had a much different conversation if he was actually going to the city and <laughs> talked about all the logistics and that kind of thing. But what we ended up... Um, the other thing that came out of that conversation was that uh, we're going to try to get our two groups together in the new future here uh, via our travels. Um, we go down to New Orleans every other year and Kansas City happens to be on the way. So we might stop and do a, a gig or two with them and they may come up here to one of the Chicago land festivals, uh, jazz festivals and spend a night in Beloit or something. So it was it was great to make a, another connection. Yeah, and there's some great jazz venues and jazz history venues in Kansas yeah. City too, and and uh, and then make sure he takes you to Arthur Bryant's barbecue, will you? Because it's he did it's, mention barbecue. Yes. Oh man, it's it's to die for. It's the best in the world. So so Chris, how did you first become aware of the essentially Ellington event, and and what piqued your interest to apply? So I had um, there were two different band directors here from Wisconsin, uh, Bruce Herring, who taught up in the Eau Claire School District, and Steve Sveum, who taught and some prairie just north of us here both had taken their bands uh had made the finals for essentially ellington and um mid 2000s i we were at festivals together or, or somewhere uh where they had heard one of my bands and said hey do you know about essentially ellington and and, and i did know about them i mean you can get the music by simply at that time sending in a postcard and they'd send you six charts for free so why wouldn't you know, you want to take advantage of that. Uh, but at the same time, I'd get those charts in the mail, look at them and go, okay, clarinet part, <laughs> crazy clarinet part, you know, trombones that play 
up in the stratosphere, you know, blues and D. Who wants to play a blues and D? I mean, Ellington, his music was pretty intimidating, to be honest with you. Um, but um, they encouraged us to send in a uh, recording one year just for comments. And we did, I think, in 2008. And then we we went for it in 2009 and uh, got in as a finalist. And then it's been, I think, nine times since then. Um, and it's been, you know, just an incredible Incredible uh, experience. Is any so other really band? To, so I really have to thank, uh, uh, you know, Steve and Bruce for that that uh, little nudge to check it out because I don't know if I ever would have, to be honest. Has any other band done nine times? Are you the world oh, yeah. record holder? There's there's some other really good <laughs> there's some other really good uh, organizations or you know other uh, bands. Uh, a couple from Seattle, I think some Prairie where Steve was. I think they have they they uh, they were going a few years before we started. So I think he's been there more than nine times. But yeah, there's um, there's a few handfuls of bands that have been there, you know, close to that or more. So explain to explain the format to to the listeners uh, and to me. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you're invited, what happens? So um, you get invited after you have to send in three recordings and um, there's usually, I think on average about a um, hundred um, entries a year. I think that's what kind of the average has been. So they'll, they'll select 15 bands out of those recordings, blind, uh, blind auditions. And um, once you're in um, you get to go to the finals, which is in New York city. Um, prior to that, they send out a clinician. Um, they used to send out members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra for a four-hour rehearsal. Um, and then it's, uh, you know, a lot of fundraising and and um, performing in the community and, and getting the money together in a very short amount of time because it's pretty expensive to go to New York. But once you're there, um, it's a three-day event uh, that includes um, a question and answer session with Wynton Marsalis, which is probably one of the one of the highlights, I think. Um, there's uh, sectionals with members from the band. They do a jam session and a dinner for, for all the uh, students. Um, and then there's a day and a half of fest the festival itself where every band gets to play three, three selections and they're critiqued by uh, five different judges and they'll select the top three um, and usually an honorable mention. And uh, then it ends with... Um, uh, performance in the last evening by the top three bands. And then the jazz and Lincoln center band usually plays, um, the selections for next year, next year's festival. And, um, and then an award ceremony after that. So it's, it's three days. It's, uh, it's probably one of the most amazing musical events I've ever participated in. Have you, have you been in the top three? We have not. We were honorable mention two years ago, I think 2018. That's, that's still quite an honor, man. Thank you. It, um, you know, I guess when, once you're it, to just be a finalist, I think is a huge honor. Um, and yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, it, it sounds like it might be very competitive, but it's, it's really more of a festival atmosphere when you're there. I mean, the camaraderie among students, um, the connections that they get to make with, with these other, um, musicians that have the same passion they do. I know that, you know, they, they still talk uh, today to some of those people they've met at this festival. So all the connections that they make, you know, it's really, it's really a great thing. And not only with the students, but with the members of the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, you mentioned that they, the camaraderie, what else have your students gained by being involved in, in that kind of an activity where they have, have really focused their energies to really perform at a high level with, with high standards? Yeah, I think um, I think that uh, they come away with a realization that in order to to accomplish anything of a great level like this, it, it requires you know a lot of hard work. Let's just put it plain and simple. Um, there are no shortcuts. Um, it requires a collaboration and cooperation with other people in the band. I mean, we only go as far as you know the weakest person in the band or how do you want to say that? But, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, it's a, um, well, get those things, you know, the collaboration and, and um, the connection to the other, the people in the band and, and, and it's just whole is working as, you know, we're all working together for one thing and, um, and how that applies to anything else in your life. 
um, to be successful. So. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's a certain amount of pressure when we prepare kids. I mean, we're going into a national con uh, festival or a big time event or a competition or whatever it is. And, and, you know, when your students know they're going to go play for like Wynton Marcellus, I mean, how, <laughs> how cool is that? Right. So what kind of pressure do you think they felt or they feel when they do that as they prepare and, and what kind of things do you do not only to prepare them musically, but also mentally for that? <laughs> we've uh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, we've done all kinds of things to prepare for that, <laughs> that moment on that stage. Um, and I can tell you it is, uh, I mean, I'm not even playing an instrument and I'm nervous up there. I mean, having to even introduce the songs, I, you know, cause you know, get, I, I get nervous right now just thinking about that, <laughs> even with that, even with that cue card in front of me and what I'm going to read. Um, but, uh, you're right. It's, it's, um, those big events. I, I mean, we have to approach it like it's just another gig, even though it's really not, but I think it all comes down in pr how you prepare and, and, and we try to play as much as possible. I mean, it's the, you know, our, our top jazz group here performs at least, you know, once a month in the, in the, in the community, we have lots of places to play at. And, um, you know, so the more performing we do, I think the more prepared you are. And, and so moments like that are not, you know, bigger than they, they need to be. Um, even though it is a great honor, of course. And, and it's, you know, you're playing in front of 2000 other people that are there that have the same passion, you know, I mean, you could certainly get very nervous and, you know, just clam up and, and not, not perform. And, um, so, you know, we, we talk through it a lot. I mean, um, visualize it, you know, all those things that you can do ahead of time as much as you can. Uh, we have, we've been fortunate to have people in the band that have been there more than once. So they talk to the other band members, say, this is how it's going to go. This is how it's going to feel backstage, you know, just try to prepare them as much as possible. But when you get out on the stage, it's, you know, it's just, uh, trying to play another great performance is what it is. Yeah. Has there been any spillover to the rest of the program? You know, yeah, any impact for the other students in the program that, that aren't in the top jazz band? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, working on music like this and trying to get it to such a high degree of, um, to, to, to such a high standard, I think, you know, that definitely spills over into everything else. I mean, whether you're playing jazz, where you're playing, you know, first suite in E flat, I mean, you still want to play that music at the highest level you can and, and, uh, you know, honor the composer's wishes and make it expressive and make it musical. So it doesn't really matter what music it is. I think it's really brought a, you know, just a different standard quality standard to the program. Are you running more than one jazz band now at the high school? Yeah, we have, um, we're lucky in that over the last several years, I've been able to add, um, first of all, we added to the, we've added to the curricular day. Um, and since we had the first, the first group in, we used to be all extracurricular. I think it was one evening a week, two mornings a week before school. And now we're, you know, every day, uh, during the, the scheduled class day and, uh, three bands. I, we had a third band last year. So it's, uh, it's definitely grown. And, um, I have to tell you probably the biggest reason for that is, and this is kind of a neat story. Um, my daughter who was in the band, uh, was graduating 19. Um, a couple of her classmates came to me probably in 2016 when she was a freshman or something and said, you know what, we need to do a summer jazz camp for the middle school. <laughs> and I was, you know, like, well, how can we do that? I mean, it's going to cost lots of money to bring people in and all this stuff, you know, where are we going to get the funds and, and, and this and that. And, um, so I, you know, probably ignored her that first year, but she kept pressing and, you know, came up with a plan and, and what we ended up doing her junior year and then again her senior year um, is the students in our top jazz band offered the camp to the middle school students. They were the teachers. They ran the sectionals. They ran the rehearsals. They ran the master classes. Of course, we you know us. Uh, I was there to supervise. And we then the second year, we even had some alum come back and help with that. And, um, you know, we went from the first year. I thought maybe we'd have enough kids for a couple combos. We had, you know a big band or two. And then the third year it exploded to like 65 kids and we had had to have, have three big bands running. And 
I mean, this was all because of students in our program wanting to give back and, and keep the, um, keep the culture going, you know? And, uh, so that was, that was pretty neat. So that's, uh, as a result of that, we had to have a third jazz band here at the high school. What a great story. Those students, man, they can come up with incredible things for us. Can't they? Absolutely. And, and sometimes you just have to, you know, get past the fact that they're, they're students and just, you know, just listen to them and uh, hear them out. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're coming out of the pandemic. I trust you taught virtually for how long? About a year? Yeah, it's, um, I, we just started hybrid uh, last week. So, uh, you know, AB cohort, I'm sure many people are familiar with. Prior to that, we were strictly online. Um, it's It's been hard. So what did you do to, uh, you know, to keep your kids uh, interested and active in music? You know, any special assignments or activities or anything that worked really well? Yeah. So one of the, I guess one of the good things that came out of this is we, um, you know, I collaborate a lot more with our choir and orchestra um, faculty here. And we came up last summer with kind of a plan of how to try to make, you know, music, music as meaningful as possible in a world where it's not anything like uh, it used to be. So we um, first and second term, we, we came up with some like mini electives. So we had um, four week classes on, um, music and film, uh, composition, uh, history of rock and roll, conducting, um, music theory. And uh, that was kind of, I mean, that turned out to be pretty popular with, with, um, with the students. They, you know, in addition to our regular band stuff that we do, you could take one of those electives um, and learn about, you know, other things about music. I mean, music is more than just playing in a band rehearsal every day. So that's kind of the approach we took. And it was, it was pretty successful, I think. Any fears while that, that whole thing was going on? What were your biggest fears during virtual teaching? Well, I mean, you, you, the biggest fear is that you're going to lose students because this is not what they signed up for, you know? And we had a real frank discussion at the beginning of the school year. And, and I, I told, you know, all of my students that, you know, I know this is not the way – you know, band band was to you, you know, last year or the year before that, you know, the, the social part is certainly gone or missing. And um, we need to approach this year and, and as a way to, you know, we'll keep working on our instrument through some different assignments, technique and, you know, we work on solos and stuff like that. But also let's look at it by learning more about music itself. I mean, it was a good opportunity to, to, to do that. But, you know, um, the biggest fear would be, you know, losing students. And, and certainly we did lose some. Yeah. I think that's been a national trend, but I think it's, they're going to come back. You know, yeah. once they get back in schools and they hear it, I think we're going to be surprised that probably there's going to be a, more of a demand uh, uh, than ever. So as you're coming out of it, have there been any hidden benefits that you didn't expect from it? Anything that surprised you that you're going to continue on doing? I think it's too early to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I'm, uh, that's a fair one. Yeah, I'm just uh, right now. I'm at a at a mind, a frame of mind where you know, I just hope next year is as close to normal as possible. You know, um, it's hard to to keep doing this. Although I will say that the hybrid, the people that do come to class here two days a week, you know, on their A days and B days, they are genuinely happy to be here and be playing their instruments again. So. I mean, that's, that's been a good thing of recent, uh, that's happened. So good for you. You still active as a performer, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have like, well, about two steady gigs, jazz gigs a week. I play piano with a trio or a quartet. And, um, I think it's so important to keep your performance chops up on whatever, whatever idiom or whatever your passion is. Um, it just, I don't know. It keeps the fire burning for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, just about music. I mean, when I have a gig, you know, later on, if it would have been this evening or whenever it is, I'm just, you know, it's something to look forward to. I still love making music and, and it's been, you know, we had a long time where we didn't get that opportunity. So. So now you're back. We're back. Yeah. So far so good. I mean, restaurants are opening and I think, uh, even though they're at 50% capacity and still six feet and all that stuff, people truly were missing music and that's, that's what they've communicated with us. And so glad to have us back and playing again and 
So that, that that's a good sign. I mean, people were missing the arts for sure. Yeah. You know, in our earlier podcast, I mentioned I was in California where we, we winter and there's this retirement, I guess, community, like a trailer park retirement community, pretty mm -hmm. much blue collar people their whole life. And, and on uh, Tuesday night, they have burger night and they have live music. And, and there was a guy playing guitar, playing really good guitar, bass player, drummer, and this incredible conga player. I mean, his conga player was nuts. And, um, uh, but it was amazing to, for me to just look around and watch the people and they were having their beers and eating their burgers and having conversations, but they were just loving the music. You know, you could see their hands tapping on their glass or on the table or they're, they're bobbing back and forth or when the guys were doing the standard, some of them knew the lyrics and they were singing along. I mean, it, it does so much to connect people, to connect to the soul of people, you know, when there's live music. And I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, I would uh, completely agree with everything you just said there. I mean, that's that's kind of the feeling I get when we're out playing again. It's just uh, it's something like I said, it's something that's been missed, and they're glad to have it back. Yeah, and you're glad to be able to do it too. I'll bet. Oh, of course. Yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. Okay, so let's get esoteric here for a minute. Uh, if if you could uh, go back in time and, and have a a conversation with any jazz artist, living or deceased, who would it be, and what would you want to talk about? Well, probably no surprise. I mean, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with Duke Ellington. Um, I've, you know, since uh, doing the festival and <clears throat> learning about his music and, and um, you know, how he wrote for the individuals in his band. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could talk about, but there's one, <laughs> one question I guess I would have. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many people know about the 1956 Newport concert where his – I mean, his career was on the verge of probably folding that year. I mean, the money was running out. The the gigs were running out. Um, and if it wasn't for Newport Jazz Festival 1956 and the famous uh, Diminuendo and Crescendo in Blue with the 27 choruses by uh, Paul Gonzalez, and then the audience going into a frenzy from the, the one lady who stood up and started dancing. And then as soon as, you know, all this is over, he's on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> you know, um, what was that moment like? I mean, going from I'm going to fold to I basically resurrected the band. You know, I, I would love to hear how that all played out and um, what was going through his mind. I mean. Yeah, pretty, a pretty amazing a moment. And, you know, what would happen if that didn't happen? I mean, how much music would we have not have gotten uh, mm. from Duke Ellington if that would have been the end? You know, someday I, I got to hook you up with the gentleman that uh, was the son of the, the man who started Humes and Berg. Erwin Berg is his name. And, you know, the stone line mutes, the red and white mutes. Yeah. Yeah. Erwin Berg is a great, great, great human being. And, and we honored him at Vandercook a few years ago and, and we were meeting with him and he talked about his dad was, you know, his dad was big time back then because of the, the big band scene in Chicago and coming through. And, and Berg talks about the fact that uh, he was in charge of getting a band for his high school prom, <laughs> right? High school prom. And so he talked to his dad and his dad says, yeah, I'll take care of you. And uh, so it's getting close to prom time. And, and, Irwin says, dad, I, I got to have a band. And dad says, I got you covered. He says, what do you mean? I got you covered. He says, I got you covered. He says, well, who's the band? He said, I got Duke coming in to play for you. Oh my. Says, Duke Ellington played for this high school band. I mean, this high school prom in Chicago. Wow. Right. And he says, so, so he said, uh, I guess after the gig or, or before the, I guess it was after the gig. Irwin says, my dad says, come on, we're going to go up and, and meet Duke. So Irwin goes up with his date and he says, I'm standing there with Duke Ellington. And I'm thinking like, I don't want to be here. I want to go make out with my girlfriend, <laughs> you know? And he looks back and he said, but can you imagine having Duke Ellington plan for your high school prom? Uh, oh my gosh. That's uh that's amazing. Um, <laughs> that would have been crazy for sure. Those would have been the days. I mean, I'm sure they did it. Yeah. You know, they were, they were, like you said, they were just trying to stay afloat. Right. Mm -hmm. So who's your go-to list when you want to listen to jazz? <laughs> uh well i mean 
Apple Music's what I use, and I just have my uh, playlist of gig music. So it's it's full of <laughs> anything that I come across that I want to a tune that I want to learn or or something that we're playing or you know as many versions of there will never be another you as I can find you know just to uh, hear different approaches to it or whatever. I mean, so I'm not like um, into any particular person. All I, although I will say I, I, I really like, um, if I had to pick a pianist, it would be Benny green. Um, who's, uh, who's amazing. I've been following him since I was in college and I've transcribed a lot of his stuff. And, and, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, as a, as a jazz pianist, that's who I would say, but I listen to all kinds of jazz. I mean, um, things that I'm working on, I tend to, so. Sure. Any new jazz artists that you've stumbled across that you were unaware of that you go like, man, I'm, I got to listen to more of this guy or gal. <laughs> it's uh, actually, you know, I, I did, I stumbled on this because I had a student, um, one of my piano students who studies with, I'm actually studying uh, myself with Mark Davis in Milwaukee. He's a jazz pianist. I still take lessons with him and I've got a couple of my pianists here in, uh, at, in our program that work with him as well. And, and one of them came over, um, during the, during the, uh, during COVID. And I had recently just purchased a refurbished 1928 Mason and Hamlin. And, um, he's lives in the neighborhood, just a couple doors down and invite him over to play on it. And he starts playing this transcribed solo. And I was like, who is that? That's amazing. Who, who, who are you playing? He's like Hampton Hawes. And I was like, Hampton Hawes. I, it's, it's a name. I mean, I've heard before, but it's uh, somebody that doesn't get mentioned in like the top tier jazz pianist. So because of my student, I went and dived into him for a few months. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's, he's not a new person. He's no longer with us, but um, I don't know. There's so many, there's so many great players out there. It's, um, you know, I'll stumble across something. I mean, I just found a really cool Roy Hargrove tune the other day that I'd never heard before. And, and and decide to learn so i mean it's you know it's uh it depends on the day charlie <laughs> yeah have you been following the peter erskine facebook posts no i oh, am not oh, i should get, uh, well, you gotta do that peter erskine and this is like he started like 120 130 days ago wow. he started posting a drummer a day oh wow <laughs> and he talks about this drummer and this recording and uh, he, he has a background on so many of these. And so if you just go to his Peter Erskine's Facebook page and, and I mean, and then he, he links the, the, the recording on YouTube so you can hear it. And it's been fantastic. I mean, it's just been a total education for me. I can, tell I you. would definitely be interested in checking that out. Yes. Yeah. How about other forms of music? You listen to any opera or, you know, classical music next, or yeah. Well, my I mean, my next go to playlist I have is probably the band directors group twice played list, <laughs> which has you know a lot of um, a lot of the important. Wait, I don't know about this there. list. Tell me about this list. You don't know about this list? No, the twice um, played group. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a list. I think Brian Wiss started it. Uh, I don't know, probably I don't know how many years ago, several, but it's um, just tunes that people have played more than twice with their bands that they really like. And it ends up making this list. And of course it's got all the, you know, the classic stuff on there, but uh, there's some things from time to time that I come across that I didn't know about and, um, and inspired by and want to program with the bands here. So that's, that's a list I, you know, will go to often. Yeah. So anything else coming up, but you got any big plans, anything else uh, for, for your program that you're hoping to do? Um, well, um, I mean, we do a lot of traveling normally, hopefully that'll come back at some point. Um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier the new Orleans trip that we do every other year. Um, it's always a highlight and, um, but other than that, no, I mean, just, uh, just trying to get through this year. It's kind of, uh, life has kind of turned into a, um, more of a, let's get through the next week or month and, See what happens after that. <laughs> so you said you've been teaching what twenty six years now? Yeah, twenty six years. So you look back at it. What are the, what are what's the thing you're most proud of? Um, probably just all the different students I've had the opportunity to meet and and work with, and um, hopefully have made some positive impact on their lives. 
Um, I know I have a lot of them come back and tell me that. So that's kind of cool. Um, that and just, you know, I mean, music's always been a part of who I am and, you know, I really just enjoy sharing that every day. I mean, that's, that's, I can't believe, you know, the time is gone that fast, <laughs> probably because it's, you know, something we love doing. So. Well, Chris, I've always been impressed with you. You're a soulful guy. You're a very sensitive and thoughtful guy. And I know you're doing a great job for your kids and man, I just so appreciate the time to reconnect with you and having you on the podcast. I wish you had nothing but the best buddy. Likewise, Charlie really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me. Chris Barron's is a soft spoken guy who was a great teacher. Imagine having been invited to the essentially Ellington's jazz at Lincoln centers Academy nine times. That is so impressive. And what great experiences Chris has provided for his students. But what I think is most important about Chris and his story is that Chris has found his niche. He has a total program. Even though he doesn't field a marching band, his students are playing in the stands for football games, and he has a fine concert band and an excellent jazz program. But the best thing that Chris offers his students is his inner passion for music and his love of people. And he offers those students that through his teaching and the experiences he provides his students. Chris Barons, it's hard to believe that you've been teaching for 26 years. And here's to many more, my friend. Keep on keeping on. Well, that's Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. I'll be back with more great conversations. I ask you to please tell your friends and colleagues about my Band Talk podcast, and I look forward to being with you again soon. Until then, this is Charlie Mangini saying, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. If you would like to send a question to Charlie or have a comment, please send an email to bandtalkcharlie at gmail.com. We hope you will let your colleagues, students, and friends know about Band Talk with Charlie Mangini and Friends. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to being with you again soon.